It's my pleasure today to present the Human Glycom project and what are we trying to achieve through this multinational initiative. You all know the Human Genome Project. So the Human Genome Project was initiated maybe 30 years ago. It took over 10 years to be finalized. When it was envisaged and when we started to work on the Human Genome Project, Everybody believed that once we read all the letters of the human genome, we will understand all diseases. We will be able to cure all diseases. And though technically the human, glycom, human genome project was a success, we read all the letters in the human genome, it did not fulfill the expectations. We did not understand the biology of life just by reading the letters in a genome. We actually learned that life is more complicated, and that genes are actually very far away from a phenotype. There are layers of complexity of gene-gene interactions, gene-environment interactions, which lead to the final phenotype. So by reading the genome, by reading individual letters, it is very hard to predict the phenotype. So actually, even after decades of research in the genetics, we have very little functional application in the clinics. Little bit in oncology, little bit in pharmacogenomics, while most of the genetic work is still research and prediction, not really application. And one of the reasons for that is that people are missing glycans from their studies. Glycans one of the f are one of the four key components of life. Yes, we have genes. They do code for all the proteins. So you can read the genome, know the proton, but glycans are synthesized in a complex network of genes and environmental interactions which cannot be directly deduced from a genome. And every living cell on this planet is covered by glycans. There is no cell which can live without a thick coating of glycans. While cells can live without a nuclei, there are many cells in our body which do not have a nuclei. So we can Cell, individual cell can live without a gene, but it cannot live without glycans. And actually, glycans are the major drivers of inter-individual differences. While medicine is still treating us all as one homo sapiens individual, like we are all equal, we know that we are not equal. And actually, the first molecular evidence that we are not equal came from glycans. When Carl Einsteiner developed blood groups, early in the, uh, in the 20th century, for which we, he got the Nobel Prize in 1943. He didn't know that these are glycans, so he called them blood group A, B, and O. Well, now we know that these are actually glycan structures, which make people different in their blood groups. But not only blood groups, in hundreds and hundreds of different features. Practically every protein which has been invented after the appearance of multicellular life is glycosylated. So it contains the polypeptide part. This is gray on this, gray on this figure. This is encoded by the gene. And then it contains glycans. Everything colored on this slide are glycans. And glycans are part of a structure. They define function of a protein without being directly encoded in a genome. So for every protein, we have a template. But to get individual glycan structure, we do not have a direct template. We have a complex network of hundreds of genes, both that synthesize glycans, so the glycosyl transferases, that degrade glycans, glycosidases, and then a network of regulatory proteins which decide which enzyme will work where on which protein in which given moment. And in addition to this genetic component, there is environmental and epigenetic component. So not only genes, but also environment, what we eat, even what we think, can affect the glycum. And this can also be encoded in epigenetic, epigenetic modifications and remembered through the cell cycles and also through generations. So there is evidence that epigenetic memory can be translated through several generations. So something we experience can be encoded in our epigenome and can affect glycosylation of our children or even grandchildren. And this results 
in at least 2,000 different glycan blocks which are attached to proteins. So if nucleic acids have four building blocks, proteins have 20 building blocks, by adding glycans to the evolutionary story, we got over got thousands of building blocks. So the life is not built out of 20 amino acids. It's built of thousands of glycan blocks, which combined with those amino acids into glycoproteins, which perform final functions of individual molecules. And actually, the glycoproteome is several orders of magnitude more complex than the proton. And contrary to the polypeptide part, glycan part is not fixed for the lifetime. You can actually change it. It's dynamic. So the way I like to present it is that glycans are kind of a functional addition to polypeptides, like the clothing is a functional addition to our body. So if you move to the cold place, this would be additional, this would be appropriate clothing. While if you come in a Croatia in the summer, this would be better. And occasionally, from genetic, environmental, epigenetic reasons, we make a mistake. We put the wrong glycan on the wrong protein in the wrong moment. And this makes us less fit for the environment, like these guys in the swimsuits are less fit for the cold environment over there. They would not survive the night if they stay like this. And if we talk about the cell membrane, then this modification is this thick fortification which we either have or do not have. Because the lipid bilayer and all the proteins is this tiny little white lane on this photograph. And the real barrier between the cell and the environment is the glycocalyx, which is this thick layer of glycans. So our cells are shielded with the glycans, which represent the contact between the cell and the environment. And there was a strong policy document published and endorsed by the US National Academies a couple of years ago, which clearly said glycans are directly involved in the pathophysiology of every major disease. And additional knowledge from glycoscience will be needed to realize the goals of personalized medicine and to take advantage of the substantial investments in the human genome and the protein research and its impact on human health. And following the document, NIH launched through its Office for Strategic Coordination between the Institutes, the Common Fund Program for Glycoscience to develop methods to analyze glycans. Because glycans are very difficult to analyze. These are chemical structures. You cannot amplify them by PCR or something like that. You have to take a biological sample and a small amount of samples, analyze those complex chemical structures. And you have to be able to do it in high throughput. Why do we have to do it in high throughput? Because what the field of genetics learned, if you do small studies, you get false results. Close to 90% of all literature in the field of the candidate gene studies is simply wrong. Because of statistical nature of research, many people doing the same research, if they don't see the difference, they don't publish it. If they incidentally have a p-value smaller than 0.05, they publish. So the literature is played with the false associations. And to be able to detect the real things, you have to do high throughput, which is clearly shown in this brilliant article by John Ioannidas published over 10 years ago, showing that initially reported effects just got this, uh, diminished with the replication of the same study. So two years ago, we had a meeting in Dubrovnik, and while we were brainstorming what should we do, the idea was born, we should start the Human Glycon Project. We should start the central site where people interested in the structure and function of glycans in humans would work together to achieve this uh, complex goal. And a little bit more than a year later, again in Dubrovnik, we met and formally launched the Human Glycon Project. We have now our website, we have the Twitter account, we have over 30 individual projects and 200 participating researchers at the moment we launched the project. And what are we trying to achieve? Our mission is very simple. We want to define structures 
and understand functions of human glycoconjugates. Cannot be simpler than that. But also, it cannot be more complicated than that. Because if the genome was complicated, with the three billion letters which had to be read, glycans are much more complicated. First, they're structurally difficult to analyze. Even if you just release glycans, they're difficult to analyze. But today, we can do it. And I think analyzing all the structures of the human glycans is doable. But these glycans are attached to the polypeptide backbones. So they can be on the different sites. And a different glycan on a different site of a different protein can have completely different functions. So we have to also analyze individual glycoproteins to see which glycans are attached there. But then again, the same protein in the different cell types can have a completely different glycosylation, which can lead to completely different functions. And this gets even more complicated if we have a complex tissue. And this all can change with time, with hormonal signals, with diet, with exposure to sun. So we really do have a tremendous task to achieve. But this is the basis of our survival. Because, for example, the war we have for billions of years between us and bugs are fought by glycans. All the pathogens attach to glycan structures on our cells. We try to fight back with the mucins, which have a similar structures, try to inhibit the glycans, uh, the, the glycan binding proteins. And then bugs evolve. They develop new structural uh, binding capacities. Then we become different. So every person would be different in the way we glycosylate proteins. And we need to understand this if we want to understand the way we interact with the microbes. For example, one part of the work done by the Rick Cummings lab is he studied the major glass, classes of glycans in human lung. And these are the major glycans in the human lungs. And if you look, some influenza viruses, they would bind to these phosphorylated glycans. But if you even look at the same strain, same H3 N2 strain of influenza virus, and analyze it through different years, so from 201, 202, 204, 205, and so on, its glycan binding properties change. They bind to different glycans. They evolved. So this is actually the reason why if we all get infected with the same virus, some of us will get severely ill, some of us will get a little bit ill, some of us will not get affected at all. Because we are different in the way we glycosylate our proteins, and viruses are different in the way they bind to them. But they change. And then, for example, we can all be infected with the virus, and then only one of us gets infected, but then in a few weeks, the virus mutates, and then it moves and infects also another individual. The other very important aspect of glycosylation is that it changes in human diseases. And sometimes it is changed as a predisposition. It's a genetic difference which makes you predisposed to the disease. Sometimes it changes because of a lifestyle which then makes you predisposed for a disease. And sometimes it changes as a consequence or as a reaction to the disease. And we have to understand what is going on. We do not understand much, but for example, we know that on immunoglobulins, this tiny little glycan, tiny little modification of its uh, FC glycan called the core fucose, is a safety switch which prevents binding to the FC gamma receptor 3A and activation of antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So if, for example, because of a genetic reason, somebody is putting too little of a core fucose, their antibodies do not have a safety switch. They attack anything they bind to, and then you have autoimmune diseases. But the other end of the spectrum, if you put too much of the core fucose, then you cannot activate ADCC, meaning you have less protection against tumors, against different infective diseases. So it's a balance which keeps us alive against the bugs and tumors, but then again, it can cause autoimmune diseases. And then you switch the balance, 
and do not have the autoimmune diseases, but you can get cancer or something similar. And one of the best examples how important this, this is, is the field of monoclonal antibodies. So monoclonal antibodies are the, the magic drugs of today's medicine. We have hundreds of monoclonal antibodies which bind to the specific targets and then erases some kind of a symptom. And one of these drugs is rituximab. It binds to CD20, eliminates B lymphocytes, it's used in leukemia and many different inflammatory diseases. The problem with rituximab is that most of its glycans have this core fucose. So they actually have the safety switch which prevents them from working. So for 20 years we are producing a drug and then making it ineffective by putting the wrong glycan. So how does med medicine deal with this problem today? It increases the dose. You have to give a huge amount of this monoclonal to a patient, which is first very expensive to produce, and second, it's also causing side effects. Recently, many monoclonal antibodies are being glycoengineered, meaning their production is modified in a way to modulate the glycan structure for proper effective functions. And one of these drugs, which is currently in phase three trials for many diseases, is ublituximab. It also binds to CD20, it also eliminates B lymphocytes, but it requires 100 to 500 lower concentration for the same effect. And the only reason why this is more effective is because it has a proper glycan. It has glycans without the core fucose. So Big Pharma needed nearly 20 years to realize that by modulating glycans, they can make better and safer drugs. And now there are dozens and dozens of glycoengineered drugs in the pipeline, and probably soon you will not be able to register a drug without making a proper glycan for a proper function you want to have. <laughs> to be able to do all these studies, Human Glycon Project is developing tools, analytical methods. For example, a couple of years ago, we compared chromatography, capillary antiphoresis, several mass spec methods, and showed that they are working for high trophic glycomics. And now we are trying to make, make these methods available to the people outside of the glycan community. Also, the Human Glycan Project is working on developing a new smart anti-glycan reagents which will simplify glycan analysis. You will not have to do a very complicated HPLC or mass spec or CE analysis. You can do a simple staining with these smart reagents and do something like a histopathology for the glycan binding. And this is something we can, which can really revolutionize pathology, for example. So what do we offer at the moment? Which resources Human Glycon Project has at the moment. Something which was announced a couple of days ago, we have an agreement between Waters, New England Biolabs, and Ganas to provide 30,000 glycan analysis for the next three years. 10,000 analysis per year. Interested clinicians, epidemiologists can approach the Human Glycon Project, suggest analysis, and we can do it either completely for free or for a nominal fee if it's a larger study. This is limited to 30,000 samples, so we have another bid with a slightly different technology, again with the Ganas New England Biolabs, but this time with Farbantix and Polyomica, which can do slightly different technology, but additional 10,000 samples per year. So we have an offer to do a 60,000 analysis to interested clinicians and epidemiologists. We also have an offer from the company in UK called Pharmatix, which is willing to enrich glycan analysis by providing the artificial intelligence analysis of the data and finding more information in the data we already have. We just had a meeting yesterday. There are some new uh, resources, new tools which will become available, so please do follow our website and join us on this complicated task of the Human Glycan Project. The analogy I like to make is if Human Genome Project was similar to putting human on the moon, the Human Glycon Project is putting humans to the Mars. It's difficult, but we can achieve it. So please.
join us. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.